Hello again, welcome back to this Damn Fool Idealistic Crusade. Uh, this video is going over my personal pick for Blu-ray disc, or um, actually I'll just go ahead and say home media release of the year for the past year of 2020. Every year I, I try and, and highlight a disc, uh, and I've always done this, it's been even long before I've had a, a YouTube channel, but I, I felt it was time to finally start making videos, and I've seen uh, the usual polls on Blu-ray.com and some other channels do some really good um, uh, selections for the year, but uh, there was already one that uh, was a particular title that uh, was, you know, one I thought would never occur and really righted one of the great wrongs of a bad transfer on DVD. So uh, I figured that would probably wind up being my disc of the year, but then it was supplanted by uh, another title. So I'm going to actually spotlight both of them because I feel both are important. Um, but disc of the year is, is a title I, I that... Uh, really excels not in just picture and sound and transfer, but also extras and the importance of a particular title, I think. Uh, particularly a title that's not had proper video releases or had a long history of uh, issues on video and bad elements. So uh, it can either be a restoration that really uh, finally surpasses a lot of that or, uh, you know, a a release uh, of a film that's really needed it is, is basically, I think, a key factor in determining a disc of the year. And it doesn't have to be the fanciest title, and it also, I think, should be something that is very cost-effective because, uh, you know, we all want the best and the brightest of the 4K releases, and we all want all the Criterion box sets and things, and that usually garners all the, the, the greatest attention. But honestly, I think there's actually great importance in maintaining a steady release of catalog titles and uh, these two releases are actually uh, in, in so staggeringly important and both have had uh, long histories with transfers and having issues and both are key titles in their genre uh, both are still horrendously underrated so um, that's that's part of the reason why uh, that that I, I figured these would probably be my disc of the year, but also I went through these with a fine tooth comb because uh, I I don't say disc of the year lightly. Um, so it, I also try to weigh out the amount of extra features that are included. Uh, so my discs of the year usually aren't bare bones, or um, you know they do represent a uh, a worthwhile investment for the Blu-ray consumer, for example. Uh, I think that's also something to keep in mind. I think uh, if a uh, standard price release is done uh, to the highest ability possible and only sets you back 20 or 30 bucks, I think that definitely says something compared to a box set that, say, doesn't hit 100% and costs, you know, significantly more than that. So anyway, uh, so it's no secret I am a great lover and supporter of the Warner Archive Collection label. I think they do, uh, I really think they do the best work in this country in terms of boutique labels. Uh, they don't always get the credit for it. They don't have the fanciest releases, nor do they have lots of swag, but what they do have is a commitment to uh, new scans where possible and getting out titles that need to be on Blu-ray. I mean, they deserve to be out. And recently, with these two titles in particular, they've really stepped up their game, not only in restorations, but also producing extras. Because normally, when an archive doesn't do extras or commentaries, uh, it's usually porting over what exists on DVD. Uh, usually, you know, it's because they don't really have the budget for it. Uh, but it it definitely means something when Warner Archive does extras or commentaries or you know commissions new materials. Uh, you know, we're used to that with Criterion and Arrow and and sometimes Kino and and everybody else. But uh, Warner Archive doing extras, it it definitely has an extra extra meaning to it because. Usually we're, we're getting movie only and just DVD legacy extras ported over. So with that being said, uh, without question, my Blu-ray disc of the year, my physical media release of 2020 for the entire year, without question, this belongs in every single library. Uh, if you own a Blu-ray player, you need this release, which is the two-disc special edition 
Warner Archive release of the iconic 1957 Hammer Films gothic horror The Curse of Frankenstein, which uh, started their run of classic gothic horrors, started their Frankenstein cycle, which is one of the great film series regardless of genre. And uh, single-handedly, this is the film that really resurrected the horror genre and has never gotten the credit for it. Um, you know, known famously for being the first major uh, horror film to show red blood in full color, the first Frankenstein film to be well known for being in full vivid technicolor. Uh, it is a work of art and uh, is part of the initial cycle of Hammer horrors that really have such uh, an artistry to them. Uh, of course, you have the, the masterful direction of Terence Fisher, the brilliant writing and structuring of Jimmy Sangster, condensing down a very lengthy novel uh, into a ridiculously tight, uh, you know, 83, 85 some odd minute runtime. The first pairing of Peter Cushing with Christopher Lee and the absolutely stunning uh, music of James Bernard and the, the, the life-changingly amazing photography of Jack Asher. And, uh, of course, Curse of Frankenstein has been in major trouble on video for a long time. Not only are there the censor cuts that have always existed, uh, but the elements were never in the greatest of shape. So uh, Warner Brothers had a uh, elements, the color separations is what they had to work with. And they did a scan of that, and uh, presumably that's what showed up on the... Uh, late release laser disc and the uh, very old DVD uh, and it's always looked rather soft and then uh, in 2012 uh, Hammer in the UK with Lionsgate put out their Blu-ray from the same Warner Brothers source and it was just really soft I mean it did finally put back in the shot of the eyeball which is the uh, famous missing piece uh, missing shot that it was uh, excised out of a lot of versions of the film but uh, it was just really, really soft, and it just it magnified all the issues that were already there on the old DVD we were used to. Um, so, I mean, it was, it was an improvement in a lot of ways, but it was also sort of like a step backward. A lot of people hated it. There was a lot of backlash. So, really, ever since then, there's been a big clamoring to try and get a proper version. But uh, it was just, you know, nobody knew what was ever going to happen. So, this was a complete surprise. It's dropped in December, so it was very late. I'm sure it was probably delayed a little bit from COVID. I'm, I'm sure maybe they wanted to originally get this out for October. Uh, and, of course, most of us didn't get our copies until January with the way the shipping scenario is. So that's why this video is a little bit late. Um, I had my original choice, but I wanted to wait until I could see this because I had a feeling, and I was right. Uh, this is a fully loaded two-disc special edition, uh, which is very very unlike what Warner Archive normally does. So again, they have stepped up their game so much. Uh, again, I have to show, I love the artwork they chose, which is a version, I believe this is a, uh, I don't know if it's an Italian poster, but it was. it's an alternate poster. So it's original art that looks gorgeous. And I love how they uh, took a shot of the Baron himself and his creature and used one for each disc. And this is a two disc set. Again, very uncommon for Warner Archive, but what it features, uh, in addition to all the extras, you actually get uh, multiple aspect ratio presentations of the film. Again, very uncommon. Warner Archive does not normally do this. So um, you get the uh, 166 aspect ratio version, which is the preferred way to see it, really. Uh, you also get it presented in 185. Those versions are branched on disc 1. And then disc 2 actually gives you the full 137 uh, full camera aperture ratio version. Um, so it's basically a, a sort of open matte presentation if you want to term it that. Uh, you gain a bit on the top and bottom and, of course, lose a little bit on the sides. And, of course, uh, being from 1957, the film wouldn't have been exhibited that way. Uh, but it was that way on video and television airings for a long time. And uh, a lot of people got confused because Hammer put out their Blu-ray in 2012 and advertised the one they also included it in 137 and acted like that was the original ratio which it is not um but i'm so pleased that it was included here because it's always amazing to be able to uh, see these films in the different presentations especially if you grew up seeing it in 137 and you also can see you know more of the top and bottom of the sets and the staging and uh also by comparing the three you can really see uh 
how Jack uh, Jack Asher uh, furnished his compositions, how he laid everything out, um, just how all of the Hammer machine came together, and really what is a watershed moment on this film. And this thing is loaded with well done extras. They're not fluff pieces. Um, uh, you have a brilliant commentary track from Constantine Nasir and Steve Haberman, who, uh, if you're familiar at all with other Hammer titles or other classic horror releases on Blu-ray, they've done a lot of commentary tracks both together and separately. And I believe it was said that um, Nasser was the one who sort of co-produced or uh, spearheaded this disc and getting all of the extras together. So this is not your run-of-the-mill um, standard release from Warner Archive. And uh, just so I can read these off, because I, I can never remember the, the specific titles of the extras. I remember who the talking heads were, but they always give them a, a fancy title. Um, so again, uh, you get the commentary on disc one, and then to maximize the bit rate, all of the extras are included on disc two with the 137 version, which of course uh, isn't taking up as much space because there is more of the transfer devoted to the uh, the pillar boxing bars, the letter boxing on the, on the sides. So uh, the features you get, um, there's a, a piece on the film and its, uh, its legacy and impact as literally the key film that resurrected the entire horror genre. I mean, it cannot be understated. Horror was pretty much dead and buried, uh, no pun intended, and it was this film that really rejuvenated it for everybody, and then uh, it sort of became a bidding war for the various other studios uh, to actually pick up Hammer titles. The Hammer was a tiny British studio, and they needed American financing, so that's why Hammer films are spread all over the place in terms of video releases. So um, that's a real, and all these extras are pretty lengthy. They're all about uh, at least 20 to 30 minutes. And, you know, you get really great key experts actually getting into the, to the meat of the material. It's not just your, your usual five to 10 minute fluff piece. And then uh, there's a wonderful piece. Uh, they call it Hideous Progeny, uh, Curse of Frankenstein and the English Gothic Tradition. And that's actually a very lengthy wonderful conversation with Sir Christopher Frayling, uh, who has actually written quite a bit on Frankenstein uh, and and gothic horror in terms of the, the literary side and how it links to uh, the cinematic tradition of gothic horror. So he was the perfect person to go to. And uh, it's a really great piece because he's, he's like out in a garden somewhere. It looks fantastic. But he also is, uh, you know, talking about the development of the novel and Mary Shelley and actually quoting from the original 1818 text. Uh, and then talking about Hammer and the, the film in particular and then how the rest of the Frankenstein cycle for Hammer goes. Um, so it's really well done. And, of course, he, he, Frailing is one of those people you could listen to for, like, days on end. Um, and then uh, I really appreciated they did an entire featurette on the genius of Jack Asher's photography. And uh, when you see these films, particularly seeing this gorgeous restoration, I haven't even touched on that yet. Um, it is just, it, 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 he could make these films look like much more than a million dollars. And Curse of Frankenstein was made on a ridiculously threadbare budget. I mean, shoestring does not even begin to describe it. Um, so I was very pleased that they, they made a, an entire dedicated featurette just for Jack Asher's work. And uh, then the last one, is an entire piece on James Bernard's iconic scores, uh, not just for this film, but they talk about uh, some of the uh, other iconic work he did for Hammer Horrors. And I really appreciated this because it's very similar in ways to all of the great uh, music extras that are on the Indicator Hammer releases. Because uh, if you've ever looked at those, almost all of them have a, have a piece talking about the music and the... Um, actual musical composition of the scores for each each film that they do of, of their Hammer box sets. So I uh, really appreciate that being here. And, of course, you get the trailer, which is actually uh, significantly cleaned up over what turned up on the DVD. Um, so on to transfer. 
this thing is breathtaking. All that softness is gone. Basically what they did was they did a new 4K scan and they were also able to digitally recombine the color separations. Um, honestly, it seems much in the way that they do with the uh, digital recombining of their uh, three-strip Technicolor restorations. And they do that to fix the fringing that happens when the uh, elements don't line up exactly right. And it's a very expensive, very time-consuming process, so they don't do that all the time. There's a lot of films that really need that um but basically it seems like a, a lot of the the same idea was applied here to the source they had those color separations and all that softness the fringing all of that is gone the color is just beautiful to look at and of course seeing this on video of the years you have to get used to the sort of weird pasty looking skin tones uh all the flesh tones are, are, are very pinkish on all the old releases um it's just always looked a, a little iffy it's looked a little weird and that's because the elements have just not been there to do a a proper clean version and so i mean they, they achieved magic with this it is just astonishing uh audio wise it's of course the original mono audio and encoded losslessly dts HD master audio track and it actually does sound a bit better than what's on the old DVD it does sound like it's been improved some uh, it also sounds better than the uh, UK uh, Hammer Blu-ray from 2012 I believe it was um, so I think that is actually a distinctive improvement there I don't know what their source was uh, I'm sure it's probably the, the the same source that they've had but it does seem like they did improve uh, even on the audio presentation and of course there's no booklet or anything. There's no fancy swag. There's no slip cover. Um, but you really don't need it. And also, the great thing is that keeps the price down. So, um, Warner Archive rarely does multi disc sets. Usually, when they do, they have a bit of a premium, like they cost a few dollars more on their MSRP. But this one doesn't. It lists price at uh, $21.99, uh, frequently on sale for under $20. Uh, they, they really achieved magic with this. That is why it is unquestionably my disc of the year for 2020. I, I don't think anything really comes close. This is a title. Uh, horror fans, Hammer fans, and just film fans in general have clamored for. We thought it was never going to happen. And particularly after what happened on Horror of Dracula when Warner Archive put it out, um, all they could do was uh, recolor time the old BFI 2007 version, with had, which had that awful uh, blue-tinted recoloring, which was just terrible. Um, but when they did that, uh, they fixed the color, but there were all these issues with the black levels. And so when you look at that, it's far too dark and all the black levels are clipped off so it's it's really a mixed bag and 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 not all that pleasant to watch all the time because it's way too dark um and that was seemingly it for for hammer so um after after that disappointment um it's really amazing that this just popped up out of the blue and really like a christmas present would have been great to have had it in October for, uh, you know, because I've watched this film every year. I mean, I can't go a, a Halloween without watching um, the key Hammer titles. And uh, really, their their main Frankenstein films are the highlight of, of their gothic horrors. Uh, most people talk about the Dracula series. And, of course, the original film and is, is a masterpiece and amazing. And Brides of Dracula is great. but uh, And then you have Prince of Darkness. But then after that, your mileage really starts to vary. Some people love the later films, some people don't. Um, but the six main uh, Hammer Frankensteins that star Peter Cushing, not not counting Horror Frankenstein, which is really its own separate thing, um, uh, they're they're all uh, well put together. Um, all but one were directed by Terrence Fisher, um, and they really are are like the the crown jewel of the overall arc of Hammer Horror. So to finally have the original film and the film that really sparked off the whole run of Hammer's iconic Gothic horrors is uh, just amazing. And again, they they really achieved magic with this release. So that is why it's my disc of the year for 2020. Again, everyone with a Blu-ray player needs this film. Everyone who is a horror fan needs this. Uh, it is an astonishing release, one that I myself thought would never happen. I thought if we did finally get a Blu-ray, it was going to be a, a compromised version uh, because Hammer Films, until recently and the past couple years, have always suffered on home video 
Um, it doesn't help that they're spread across so many different um, studios in terms of ownership and their uh, their elements are all over the place and they're usually they're stuck in old video masters and they're missing pieces and uh, they're stuck in censored cuts and things. Um, so I'm, I'm just astonished by this. Every extra is worth your time. None of them are fluff pieces. The commentary is excellent. Um, the information gone over here is also, there's a lot of brand new material here. They actually do discuss some of the original draft screenplay materials uh, that were actually from the original conceived version uh, that was actually done by different writers other than Jimmy Sangster. So um, Nasir and the other people uh, on the uh, extras have actually uncovered new material and presented it here for the first time. So even diehards like myself, you know, can gain new uh, intelligence and information from the Blu-ray extras, which usually, you know, admittedly, you kind of go through hoping for a little nugget here or there, but you hear a lot of the same stories over and over. There is brand new material in, in all of this stuff, and all of it is worth your time. It is a stunning release, um, and this takes my number one spot for best disc of 2020, hands down, no contest. Except there is. There's, there's a slight one, and I, so I have to mention it as well, because uh, until Curse of Frankenstein happened, this was going to be my disc of the year, and it was my disc of the year for months and months and months. Um, also a great surprise, and also a key horror film that suffered terribly on its DVD release. So um, I want to spotlight this as well, because this would technically be my number two disc of the year, I guess, if you, if you want to call it that. And also from the Warner Archive... This is their release of the two-strip Technicolor horror film Mystery of the Wax Museum from 1933. This is a title that was ruined on DVD for some reason when it was put out. It wasn't even given its own release. It was treated as a bonus feature on the House of Wax DVD, which is the uh, 3D remake of this film. And while I, I love that film and I'm a giant bits of Price fan, um, when, you, when you look at the two side by side, this has all the pre-code swagger, all of the tough-talking 1930s-ness that you really love from pre-code era films and particularly the Warner Gangster films. It's also directed by Michael Curtiz and really was done back-to-back -back with the other two-strip Technicolor horror film, Dr. X. So um, basically almost all the cast and crew of Dr. X rolled over into Mystery of the Wax Museum. So they make a great double feature pairing, but for the longest time, uh, they were thought lost. And uh, Dr. X did have a simultaneously produced black and white version, but Mystery of the Wax Museum did not. And so for the longest time, this was thought lost until the... Um, the sole surviving print at that time turned up in uh, the personal vault of Jack Warner in the 1970s. And then it sort of had a rebirth along with Dr. X, and it got some showings, and then um, UCLA did a uh, earlier restoration of them uh, in the photochemical era. And those turned up on TCM airings, VHS, and Laserdisc. But then when it came out on DVD, it was treated as an extra on the uh, House of Wax, Wax disc. And for some reason, um, they, the two-strip technical is very strange, uh, as particular to modern audiences. But basically, all it can do is reproduce tones in red and green, uh, and then mixtures of the two. So you get a lot of browns as well. So you get red, green, brown, and of course, black as well. So... It's, it's a very striking image. Uh, it started to drive a lot of people crazy because it got overused on musicals throughout the, um, throughout the time period. So uh, Warner Brothers had to use up their contracts, so they decided to do these two horror films. And they're really unlike anything else. And because of the, the weirdness, the almost strange, surrealistic look of Two Strip Technicolor, it's, it's lifelike but also completely unlifelike. It gives these horror films a, an edge that they would that they already had because they were pre-code. So there's a lot of little grislier bits that you wouldn't get. Um, particularly, you get more grisly stuff in here than you do in House of Wax because that, of course, was 1953. But the two strip factor really enhances this. And for some reason, on DVD, all of the greens uh, were turned blue. So for the longest time when you looked at it, it was completely horridly wrong. Um, 
it's really one of the worst DVDs I've ever seen because it completely undoes the look that was even possible to do with two strip Technicolor. So um, for years, I told people they should really go see Mystery of the Wax Museum, but I'm like, you can't look at the available versions. You have to go back to VHS and Laserdisc. And uh, those versions were sourced from the older cleanups and they couldn't really do a lot with them. So they have much more damage and a lot more noise and things. Um, but they're so presentable, and so for years I just rewatched this on Laserdisc, and uh, because that had the correct color, so did the VHS tape. So lo and behold, Warner Brothers announces their uh, Warner Archive announces they're coming out with this from the UCLA new restoration that was just commissioned, and I was just shocked. Um, so this uh, this was my most amazed release uh, coming out. And then, of course, they dropped the news about uh, Curse of Frankenstein and, of course, many other catalog titles they did. Um, but this this was just astonishing. The restoration work here, it looks brand new. All of the inherent damage, the really terrible damage in spots that we were used to on the old versions, it's gone. I mean, it is astonishing. And the work they did on... Not just the color timing, getting the two-strip look right, not just the cleanup... But the audio restoration work they did is nothing short of miraculous. It, uh, you know, the the noise floor on the old versions is really there. It, the, the old versions are very crackly, very noisy. There's a lot of ground hum uh, because this film barely survived. And what they were able to do is also mix in pieces of a second element they found, which I believe was actually a French print. Uh, that did have some subtitling and stuff, so it obviously was not um, what they would have wanted to use, but it's amazing that they found a second source to be able to use um, for picture and sound when uh, portions of the uh, lone English print were um, really in, in terrible rough shape. So um, that, that I'm sure, really helped in the restoration process uh, because it was something that wasn't really available before, but... I mean, this looks and sounds like a brand new film. It, It's like seeing it for the first time, just like the disc for Curse of Frankenstein. So this is another must-own. This is another must-own for any horror fan. And again, unusual for Warner Archive. We have significant extras on here. So um, we do get the credit for the UCLA restoration. Let me see if I can get that to focus there. And with also credit for uh, the Film Foundation. So this was uh, partially co-funded and um, also done by the Film Foundation. And uh, again, this is this is just staggering compared to um, you know the versions we've had. So not only does this fix the awful DVD, which I think is one of the worst DVDs ever made because it is so completely terrible it can't even present the film's color right um and it it, it it wasn't really even its own release it was just treated as an extra you had to flip over the house of wax dvd and then you got mr the wax museum just kind of thrown on there um but the restoration work here is stunning the extras um they don't sound like a lot but that's deceptive um so you do get a piece on the restoration comparing the before and after talking about the secondary French print they used talking a little bit about the audio restoration work it's not super long but it's it's very informative and uh, it's actually narrated by Scott McQueen who participated and really head, headed up the restoration and also did one of the commentary tracks for the film um, but he gets into the nitty-gritty and you get a nice five or ten minutes uh, getting into the nitty-gritty of the restoration work that they did and of course for me I want to know as much of that as I can so um, all that stuff is just like a tantalizing glimpse but I mean they definitely had their work cut out for them with this and then of course uh, you do get a um, a nice little featurette uh, about Fay Ray, and it's actually with uh, her daughter, who wrote a wonderful book about her parents' relationship, uh, which I highly recommend. Uh, it's about Fay Ray and uh, Robert Riskin, and not only their careers in Hollywood and how they met and how their careers kind of sort of uh, came together and diverged, and then in the um, how their lives went during World War II and so on and so forth. Um, so it's cool actually getting to see her talk about this stuff because I read her book and I couldn't even put it down. It was so good. Um, so it was really cool being able to see her actually talk about this stuff instead of just reading it. And uh, that was that was a really nice piece. Again, not the usual talking head fluff piece. Uh, but then you actually get two feature-length commentaries. 
and you think, oh, well, this is a short film, you know, it's, it's, you know, 78 minutes. It's, it's not, you know, it's like an hour, it's literally an hour and 18 minutes. How much could you get in a commentary? Um, well, of course you have one commentary track, which is done by Alan K. Road, who wrote the wonderful biography on Michael Curtiz, uh, and has done a number of excellent commentaries. So that is a fact filled hour and 18 minutes. And then the other one, is in a lot of ways a sequel to one of the best commentary tracks I've ever heard, which is for the uh, first Technicolor two-strip uh, horror film, Dr. X, done by Scott McQueen. So Scott McQueen comes back and does a commentary on Wax Museum. So um, I always re-listen to his commentary. I re-watch these films every Halloween, and uh, I always listen to his commentary from the DVD of Dr. X. And I'm always like, man, I wish he did a commentary for Wax Museum. Well, now you finally get that. Um, so worth it alone for the restoration worth it alone for the extras and the commentaries um you know it's like getting to go to your own private seminar with just facts thrown at you for a straight hour and 20 minutes uh times two plus a featurette um and all at the normal usual standard warner archive price that is affordable and frequently on sale um when these titles go on sale and their usual four for 44 sale on the uh, warner brothers shop website they are absolute musts um but honestly the best news is apparently the restoration for dr x is forthcoming it will come out from warner archive collection and it's recently been said they will actually include the simultaneously shot from different angles black and white version, uh, which has been um, unavailable on video. That was the version you could see for the longest time. Then they found the color version, and the color version kind of took over. So I've never seen the black and white version. I've always wondered what it was like. Um, there were rumors there was a black and white wax museum, but that was not the case. They actually snuck in the, the doing the black and white version on uh, Dr. X. So that is actually forthcoming in the next year. So that's going to be really exciting. But uh, there you have it. These are my discs of the year for standalone single releases for 2020 and uh, it was not not intentional that they were both warner archive but um i i think just it, it just happened that way um and again i do think it's important to always factor in the cost of releases because there were so many great releases this year uh, you know i just didn't have the time or the money uh, especially not the money to go for every single release that I was just dying to. There's still so many that I want to catch up on. And of course, everybody's lists are going to be different. But these two films have had such a long history on video and have needed this royal treatment for so long. I am so very pleased that these releases are out now. People can discover these films for the first time or rediscover them in these amazing editions with really truly worthwhile extras these are not just fluff pieces these are really standout essential blu-rays they are two of the best blu-rays i've ever come across uh not just for transfer film importance extras but also being affordable and available to all who are interested in them so that does it for my standalone discs of the year for 2020. Uh, hopefully uh, you enjoyed this video. I'm going to try and do one every year. Um, I don't know if I'll do a top 10, but I want to at least you know spotlight what I think is, is probably the most important title every year. Because I, I do it anyway. I should have done one uh, a video for Disc of the Year 2019. I just... Um, I was still getting my channel up and going and just uh, it didn't really occur to me, but I wanted to do it for, for this year because these two are just really that good. They are worth their weight in gold. So um, and they, they were purchased by me. There's there's no there's no um, uh, in, enticement from Warner Archive, although <laughs> I would love to get review copies because it would be easier on my wallet. But I am proud to support their work. Uh, again, I, I really do think they they do the best the best job of any by any label in the states. I really do. Uh, their work is so consistently excellent. They do the best they possibly can uh, with not the most money, uh, not the not the largest of uh, groups or offices. They're really just you know one cog inside the giant wheel that is uh, Warner Brothers and the the Time Warner and everything big conglomerate machine. So, 
Uh, I my hats off to them. Uh, these are my discs of the year for 2020. Well, since I did disc of the year for 2020, I felt I should probably also do box set of the year for 2020. And that's an interesting distinction to make because box sets allow you to go further in terms of extras and what you can do, and you know having the nice swag and packaging. But I, I feel a lot of people usually get swept up in how fancy they can make a box set, and usually, the unfortunately, the negative side is the actual focus on the content uh, becomes much more about the elaborateness of the packaging and not so much the titles within. So I, I, I always try to keep that in mind when I'm looking at trying to rate discs every year in releases, because I do think the importance of the films being released, their video history, or their lack of a real video history uh, also should play a factor in addition to packaging presentation, transfer, extras, and price. So with that in mind, there were so many great releases this year. Again, I wish I could afford all of them and have the time to go through all of them, but neither of those is possible um, in any reasonable sense. So there was a there was a pretty clear standout for me because, of course, uh, admittedly, my focus is much more in the classic era. But uh, this is a, a release that is not only from a label that practically always goes above and beyond, not just in uh, getting titles that aren't regularly covered or released, but also um, making sure every release they do is above and beyond in terms of packaging and extras and presentation. Um, so with all that being said, uh, my box set choice for box set of the year for 2020 is uh, actually um, not from this country. <laughs> Surprise. Uh, it is, I'm trying I do this to where it's, looks nice at first. So uh, my choice for box of the year 2020 is actually from Indicator in the UK, and it is their release of John Ford at Columbia, 1935 to 1958. This is done in the usual style they do of their box sets. So you have the wonderful little indicator slip that shows you the titles in their original font. So you slip that off. And of course, these are limited, so this is number 1583 out of 6,000. And as always with these, it is a bit pricey to import them, but uh, these box sets are so beautiful and so well done that uh, if you're interested in one of these, go ahead and get it before it's gone. I've already missed out on several, and I'm just beating myself up over it. So these are four titles uh, Ford did for Columbia. Of course, Indicator has a good partnership with Sony, so it's very easy for them to license Columbia titles, uh, much easier than other studios. And usually different labels kind of sort of have uh, really solid relationships with certain studios over others. So that's why you see a lot of Columbia releases or Sony releases now uh, that are done by Indicator. Beautiful, gorgeous artwork, and it's the nice... Uh, very hard, um, solid box. I don't know exactly what you call this. I feel a bit silly. I should know that. Um, but if you've ever looked at one of these boxes, all the indicator boxes are like this. It's like a really solid book. Um, it's also great that, you know, it still fits on a shelf. It's it's not too large. And of course, being indicated, they list all the extras on the back and just just look at this. This is just, <laughs> this is catnip for me. Um, these These releases are always loaded with extras and uh, an indicator release of a film is really worth its weight in gold. So the titles included are of course, uh, we'll go in chronological order, so The Whole Town's Talking, which is a really interesting picture uh, Ford made with uh, Eddie G. Robinson, and it's actually written by uh, Joe Swirling and Robert Riskin, so it sort of has the flavor of a Frank Capra film of the 1930s, which is what I found really interesting Everybody likes to talk about Capra, but they usually don't talk as much about his writers, particularly Robert Riskin, who is his most frequent and famous uh, writing partner. And Riskin really helped create a lot of what is referred to and known as the Capra touch or Capra feel. So there is a lot of what we associate with the Frank Capra style in this film, and it was made by John Ford. Of course, being Indicator and being one of their limited releases, you get beautiful interior, you get reversible art, which I'll show you there. And then what I've always loved about their booklets, um, you know, we kind of expect releases to have all this swag and booklets now. And it's like, well, you know, it, we kind of expect a lot. But, um, you know, they they do a booklet. They they literally do a booklet. So it's, it's quite hefty. Gorgeous usage of stills. 
and you know the essays you know they're they're not just in a section of each page they take up the entire booklet and it's broken up into um, usually their booklets have uh, several different essays in there so it's it's um, and it covers all the aspects of a film and then vintage interviews and vintage um, advertising pieces but I've always loved um, I always talk about the presentation at the end and then on the back they always find a still of the director on set somewhere so here you have a beautiful shot of John Ford Gene Arthur and Eddie G Robinson I adore this film you've really got to go and see it if you have it and of course as with every indicator release, absolutely loaded with extras and commentaries. So um, there's a reason why indicator has become my favorite label in the world. Uh, that is just one of the many reasons why. Next up is the interesting film, The Long Gray Line from 1955. And um, this is actually the title in this box set that is a, a Blu-ray premiere uh, in this set. The other three have come out um, in the States on Twilight Time, or they've come out in uh, Europe on um, uh, other labels in other countries, usually ports of like the DVD Master. But this one has never been on Blu-ray before. And uh, like most of these, um, it's actually a brand new 4K restoration, and it's loaded with extras. And what's also interesting, you get uh, two different audio track presentations. So there's a stereo mix, and then there's a three-channel mix. Um, of course, this was originally in CinemaScope, so it would have been ostensibly a four-channel mix, but I don't know if... Um, the uh they just mixed it in three track or they lost one of the um they lost the surround track that's usually what happens they lose the mono surround so they just have the original left center right left over but i'm not sure um if it was um originally in only three track so again you have the beautiful reversible original art so you usually get a choice indicator usually does um it's usually like a uk poster on one side and then the us poster on the other I think that's what these are, but I may be mistaken. Um, but they always do original materials. And I love their booklets. Like, And well, what always gets me is they always have a director shot on the back. And they always try and get something from the actual film shoot of the particular title you're looking at. And just beautifully done. Wonderful essays, gorgeous stills, and um, you know when Indicator does a booklet, they're they're not they're not joking around. They're not kidding. These are just wonderfully done. This one is another one of the four films that's really underrated. Doesn't get talked about very much. So this is Gideon's Day from 1958. Uh, it's it's really interesting because you get to see Ford operating in in Britain, and because uh, this was obviously not a completely Hollywood production. And um, I'm just glad that they did all four of these because uh, most people would probably just license one uh, or do like Twilight Time did and just do one at a time. But they also, you know, doubled down on the extras. But then again, this is Indicator. We've come to expect really gorgeous, absolutely loaded releases from them. Of course, another fantastic booklet. Still on the back of Ford on the set with the camera. And just loaded with stills and here's the reversible art now lastly this is the film that was restored at 2k so this is the only one that didn't have a brand new 4k restoration for this set um, but it still looks fantastic so this is the phenomenally underrated the last hurrah which stars spencer tracy and uh, this was previously done on blu-ray here in the states by twilight time so this is the same master but the indicator release vaults ahead in terms of extras and packaging and everything again wonderful booklet Fantastic essays and a shot of Ford from the production. And here's the reverse art with the alternate poster artwork. And then here's the rear detailing all the extras. And you always have to like kind of squint a little because they just they present every single extra on the boxes and the outer box. But um, always loaded everything they can possibly throw in they do what i've always appreciated they actually take the time 
to include when available the um, the Super 8 cut down version. So uh, this film includes the Super 8 home reduction version. For those who don't know, uh, long before home video existed, uh, basically the best you could possibly do if a film was popular enough or if they made one for it, uh, you could get a little reel of Super 8 and you, with uh, you know highlights from the film. Uh, usually it would be silent and they'd have to put subtitles on and title cards to explain what was going on. But, uh, you know, it'd be a little 5, 10, or um, if you got the fancier ones that were longer, you could be, uh, it could be 15 or maybe even 20 minutes. Uh, but it's usually, usually around 10 to 12 minutes. So it'd be a super digest version of the film. Um, so it's really amazing to see those. And uh, Indicator has, has a habit of including those when they can. I've seen it on some other labels releases, but uh, a lot of Indicator releases have these really cool uh, artifacts of a different era, these Super 8 cut down versions for home exhibition. So yes, um, being a gigantic uh, Ford fan and Ford devotee and Ford nut, uh, this was just music to my ears. Uh, Ford is still horrendously underrepresented on Blu-ray. Um, the Ford at Fox set on DVD was amazing, and I keep hoping that um, has a Blu-ray um, successor, but that has not happened yet. And with the uh, the Fox buyout, uh, the whole Fox library is apparently in a no man's land of releasing status. So um, this was a wonderful um, surprise. Uh, and the non-Fox titles are not as talked about as much. Um, again, Last Hurrah was the main one that of these four that most people would have been aware of since it's been released by Twilight Time. Of course, now Twilight Time went away. Now they're back. But I'm pretty sure that that disc is out of print. So, um, But the indicator release adds a lot of new extras and such. So done in their usual absolutely gorgeous packaging style crammed to the brim packed with essential extras these great booklets the great art and then three of the four have brand new 4k restorations it is a no-brainer a must own please go and get a copy before they sell out because you will be regretting it when you don't um but that being said if you do miss out indicator is very good about um couple months later they will reissue everything as standalones but you lose the box and you usually lose the booklets as well that's what the limited edition part is about um, you can order things directly from their website or choose a site to import them but uh, with COVID and everything that's added some more expense but if you do ever decide to order from their website uh, their shipping although it is pricey um, it is astonishing I've got I've ordered from them directly the first time this past year and I got a box set from the UK to the US even in the middle of COVID they FedExed it to me and it was here within like two and a half days I was stunned and it was packaged in a in a box um, with so much padding and bubble wrap it was practically bulletproof I it's the best shipping I've ever seen for a blu-ray release uh, let alone one coming all the way from the UK so once again, summarize my Blu-ray box set of the year for 2020 is Indicator Powerhouse's release of John Ford at Columbia, 1935 to 1958. Um, just beautiful work as always from Indicator. Titles I thought would never get this deluxe royal treatment and uh, really worth the, the, um, the, 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 it's really worth it for their importance alone. I mean, any, any Ford picture is, a picture of that should be studied and analyzed, uh, you know, to ridiculous degree. Uh, it's it's like looking at Hitchcock pictures. Every Hitchcock picture is important. Every John Ford picture is important. So I'm so happy this release exists. So happy I, I just went ahead and bit the bullet and got a copy because these indicator boxes are just works of home video art. They, they really are. So so pleased with this. I will return to this yearly, probably. Um, can't wait to rewatch all these extras and everything again when I pull this off the shelf again. So this is my box set choice for 2020 for box set of the year. Thank you so very much for watching and keep your Blu-rays and your physical media spinning.